a very good afternoon everyone on behalf of drug discovery hackathon 2020 training committee chairman dr gn sastri i welcome you all for the vertical one session of today and today we have dr arjun ray with us to deliver the lecture in this session dr arjun ray he is a assistant professor in indraprastha institute of information technology new delhi and he is a computational structural biologist and he earned his phd from institute of genomics and integrative biology and his main area of interest is to understand how biological process especially on disappearing the mechanism of crispr and elucidating the molecular interactions in the reverse cholesterol pathway structural and structural genomic problems as a structural biologist he has been regularly working with the techniques computer aided techniques such as structural prediction molecular dynamic simulation and biomolecular docking and today he will be talking about overview today he will talking about overview on receptor partners in drug thank you sir please take over so uh is it visible yes okay perfect thank you dr nagmani and uh, good afternoon everyone uh, i'm arjun ray and i would like to welcome you all to this 10th talk of this drug discovery hackathon training program this talk is part of the track 1 series and is titled overview on receptor which are proteins the partner in drug discovery so today's talk shall revolve around the basic concepts of protein structure we shall delve into structural features of a protein and the surface characteristics of the molecule the primary purpose of my presentation is to expand all your minds to visualize properties of the protein in three dimensional space uh, we shall also delve into the basic concepts of receptor ligand interactions and properties governing them the talk shall touch upon many topics that will be discussed and taught extensively in the coming weeks and finally i would like to introduce you all to the realm of dynamics where all biological processes occur hopefully uh, with the examples and case studies i have prepared you would at least appreciate and have a feel of the various techniques required in embarking on the drug discovery hackathon exercise so let's begin so here i would like to uh, like you all to consider this piece of paper where i have randomly marked with different marker pens this is classically our one dimensional space and understanding now if i turn this paper into a ball you shall observe that various crevices and contours are formed now we can see that while making uh, of those colored patches are hidden and many of those are hidden a few of them now show up on the surface and in fact are on these contours now i would like to expand your imagination to see that various specific letters are actually part of these colored patches these alphabets are what is known as amino acids the building block of any protein now if i further told you that these amino acids actually have a very distinct chemical property and specific properties assigned to specific amino acids one would now start to get a feeling of the behavior of these gorges you saw earlier so is my cursor uh, visible hopefully it is so uh, 
you can now already appreciate that the crevice where the blue patch residues now seem to be are actually positively charged uh, and we shall have a positively charged effect. Now, with that concept in mind, let me elaborate a little more on amino acids. So amino acids can actually be characterized in various chemical groups, as shown here, where you see uh, negatively charged amino acids, positively charged amino acids, polar and non-polar. Now, amino acids are the basic building blocks of the protein, as I said. They contain carboxylic acid group and an amino group at the C alpha carbon and the carbon adjacent to the C double bond O because they have a both weak acid and weak base present. They actually exist as a salt. Each amino acid contains a different side group. As you can see marked here in yellow. Some of these uh, side groups are polar, others may be less, and polarity of these groups affect the properties of the amino acids when they are combined to form proteins. Now, here you can see that there is a random arrangement of polar and non-polar amino acids with the side chains protruding from the backbone. This polypeptide chain, when folded into its functional form, typically results in nonpolar side chains as part of their core, while the polar amino acids line the outside of the molecule. This folded state, if functional, is called a protein. Hence, there's a direct connection, which you can appreciate here, from the one-dimensional space to the three-dimensional space and hence its functionality. Now, proteins can actually be divided into various hierarchical uh, states. So we have the first, we have first the primary amino acid structure. That was the polypeptide chain you saw even on the sheet of paper. This exists in one dimensional. Next, you have amino acids when in specific conformations give rise to what is known as secondary structure. These are actually considered the building blocks of the protein structure. These secondary structure are now part of a tertiary structure, which is the overall three-dimensional arrangement of its polypeptide sequence in space. It is generally stabilized by outside polar hydrophobic, hydrophilic hydrogen, and ionic bond interactions and the internal hydrophobic interactions between the nonpolar amino acid chains as we saw in the core. Finally, there's another state which is known as the quaternary structure, which consists of two or more polypeptide chains or subunits. These proteins are generally called um, oligomers because they have two or more subunits and quaternary structure describes uh, the manner in which subunits are arranged in a native protein. Now, it's intuitive to uh, understand that the folding of one dimensional polypeptide shall give rise to a specific surface and hence specific surface properties. Here we have an example where we see serine, arginine, glutamic, threonine and serine to be specifically arranged on the surface such that it can bind the cyclic AMP mo molecule. Uh, now, all the side chain arrangements actually give rise to its function of this protein and the resultant interactions stabilize the complex. So, now, one obvious question in lieu of the hackathon is where do you find these three dimensional structures of your protein? So the repository that hosts experimentally resolved 3D structures, which can include crystal structures, cryo resolved structures, NMR structures. 
are hosted on the RCB uh, site, where which link I have provided here. One can uh, basically just simply search and see if your protein of interest has been experimentally solved or not. It becomes tricky now if your protein structure is not available. So uh, before going further on this, I'd like to drive your attention towards this plot that shows the distribution of fraction of dissimilar function versus sequence identity. This data shows a very wide overall divergence among different protein families in all range of sequence similarity. It is clear that there is a sharpening of distribution and a decrease in the mean corresponding uh, to a greater fraction of similar function. And with the few outliers as the sequence similarity increases. So what in simplistic term, what it means is that with increase of sequence identity between proteins, one can expect similar function. Now this concept is the cornerstone of the field of protein modeling, which is to do with the unavailability. Here is the usual outline of homology modeling, which in which homology means same or similar. Uh, without going into detail, as this will be taught extensively by other experts in the field, the protocol starts with your protein sequence of interest and finding a st template structure. After alignment, we build a model, and this model is uh, assessed for its correctness. So the only take home message I would like to uh, share is that with higher sequence identity between your query sequence and your template sequence, the better shall be the quality of your model. Here we can see that as the sequence identity goes from 33% to 41% to 77%, the model accuracy and quality also increases. Now that, uh, now here, while we have talked about the basic structure of a protein, which in this case is a receptor, now let me focus back to the receptor ligand interaction. So here in the green, you see the protein and you have a yellow uh, ligand, which could be another protein, a substrate, any molecule, and which non-covalently interacts at the binding site, which is shown here and here. Uh, so here what we are observing is that the substrate and the proteins possesses specific complementarity in terms of geometric shape that fit exactly into one another. This is basically the fundamentals of the lock and key model of interaction. Now, like a lock and key into a key, uh, only the correct size and shape of the substrate, which is the key, would fit into the active site of the protein which would be the keyhole. The lock and key theory first was postulated by M. L. Fisher in 1894, and it shows the high specificity of enzymes. However, this model did not explain the stabilization of transition states of the enzymes. The alternate theory is the induced fit model. The induced fit model suggested by da Daniel Koshlin in 18, uh, 1958 uh, suggests that the active site continues to change until the substrate is completely bound to the active site of the enzyme, at which point the final shape and charge is determined. So hopefully you get, everyone can see how this shape has now changed into this. Uh, unlike the lock and key mechanism, the induced fit model actually shows that the enzymes 
are rather flexible structures, while here it was a rigid model. Now, both of these models were basically developed for enzyme substrate interactions. Uh, this is exactly what you now you can imagine when it comes to the drug receptor interaction. And to perform that computationally is the whole field of docking. So like I previously explained, even in docking field, we have what is known as the rigid docking and a flexible docking. Now rigid docking, this is an approximation uh, that treats both the ligand and the receptor as rigid and explores uh, only the six degrees of translation and rotational freedom. Uh, most of the docking suits employ rigid body docking, and this is relatively computationally inexpensive. Now, a more common and a realistic thing would be having the ligand flexibility as well as the protein receptor flexibility. Ideally, however, protein flexibility should be taken into account, but it is very computationally expensive. And induced fit docking is used with flexible binding sites. Uh, now, I think we all would agree that the flexibility of the receptor is more closely related to biology, and hence, I would like to emphasize that in biology, interactions are dynamic. Now, we know that atoms actually never stop jiggling. And you can see here that even in this molecule, the name is not important, but you have motions which at room temperature are constantly vibrating. So in real life, atoms are actually always constant in motion, and henceforth, even proteins are. They will not go to an energy minimum and stay there, so there is going to be an oscillation between different transition states, and the simulation uh, is all about the field of molecular dynamics, which samples this Boltzmann distribution. Now, once I have said this word of molecular dynamics simulation, is this is a method for analyzing the physical movements of atoms and molecules. Uh, the atoms and molecules are allowed to interact for a fixed period of time and giving the view of a dynamically evolution of the system. Uh, traditionally, uh, molecular dynamic simulation is dealing with Newton's motion of equation, and it can uh, range and scale up from hundreds of atoms to millions of atoms now. Uh, the basic steps of the simulation are given here but I would not go into the deeper details of it as it, have, it shall be taught in depth to all in the subsequent lectures. The only concept I would like to touch upon is that equations of motion that are incorporated in, in the simulation. And, and this is what drives a molecular dynamics powerful tool as it gives a very close to reality representation now, so henceforth, MD simulation is to capture fluctuation and conformation changes of proteins and stability of protein ligand interaction. To further elaborate on this point, now that I've highlighted how MD simulation can capture uh, dynamics, uh, I would like to come to the role of environment for receptors. Imagine this scenario where you have a protein here, and this protein was crystallized, and the PDB ID is given here. Now, this crystal structure should have been in its native lipid environment, but here I have shown that it would have lied in this region. Now, with the power of molecular dynamic simulation, we can actually equilibrate 
this protein in its native membrane lipid environment. So here, the RMSD is so the uh, analysis is not important, but what one can see is in nanometer scale or even in angstrom scale, the protein deviates almost to the factor of 14 angstrom. And these are multiple replicate simulations from my lab, which uh, shows all of the simulations converging. Uh, if you if one had to uh, color and map the regions which fluctuate the most being in its native environment, we see regions on the top as well as on the bottom. But the major difference is, so this was our starting crystal structure, and this is our MD resolved crystal structure. And one can immediately see that there is a curling up of this red region, which has ended up here inside the protein pocket. So I guess this is one example which shows that environment matters. Why is this going to be important? The drug uh, discovery hackathon shall deal with a lot of proteins which are on the viral membrane. And one should always remember to check the crystal structure where you have to study the protein and drug interactions. How, what is the native condition in which the protein resides? Because there could be conformational changes involved with that. Now, next is when I've spoken about the conformational changes in terms of uh, leading towards binding site. I generally in my courses that I teach, I always start with this door paradigm. The door paradigm is to deal with finding the door and the right door. So we see a house here with basically no doors. Then there could be a case where you have so many doors, you don't know which one is your correct one. And finally, you could actually have a door, but it's not accessible properly. So here would be a more realistic idea of this door paradigm. You see here is a protein, and there are these two sites which apparently would seem that are very accessible, and one can imagine some drugs sitting up in these regions. Now, what if I said that this is the more realistic picture of this protein, and this uh, representation is the surface representation. So this is to deal with the van der Waal distances. So the van der Waal distance, as many of you may know, there is the distance which is between two non-bonded atoms in adjacent molecules just touching one another. And I would like to highlight this even further with an example where you imagine these three points. So this green point, seems to be very accessible through these two blue points. But what if now the van der Waal radii shows that the green point, which was seemingly accessible, is actually not? So hence, I would again like to emphasize here is perhaps that even though these two points were accessible and seemed very uh, readily available. Accessibility of a site is actually critical and van der Waal radii and steric hindrances play a huge part in this. Now shifting a gear here, I would like to take you all on an extreme case of a protein ligand interaction. Here we actually have a biological molecule known as ApoA1. Again, the protein name doesn't matter, which has all these ligands around it. Here in this case are cholesterols. Now here I would hopefully hope that what we are going to see is that how does the cholesterol interact with this protein, which would be a classic protein ligand interaction 
So now we see that the ligands actually distribute itself in two sites. And due to, for some reason, it actually now starts unraveling the whole protein. The population which were distributed on two ends of the protein have now uh, turned into one larger population. And this is where molecular dynamics uh, strength shows in its true colors. As the cholesterol is being incorporated within the protein, the protein actually is engulfing the whole population and it's unraveling itself. And finally, it reaches a state where all the ligands are basically the core of the protein, while the protein is wrapped around the population. So this is an extreme condition where a ligand can, this is food for thought to think about that when we talk about drug interactions, uh, it's generally one pro receptor to one drug is possible, which actually are induced upon the receptor which could lead to a completely different effect. Now, here, the insight I wanted to give was that this whole process that you saw is actually driven by hydrophobic interactions. The patches that you see here, the pink patch and the red patch, are actually hydrophobic residues which are lining on the surface which are also marked here as site one and site two. Now, another example of uh, the surface chemistry would be something to do with electrostatics. Now, in electrostatics, this is a, a, a protein crystal structure for pneumonical surface integer, which is bound by these green balls, which are cadmium atoms. Now, this would be the van der Waal radii representation of this protein, where you have these two chains. And if you remember what we spoke about the uh, hierarchical states, so here we have actually two subunits, which you can call uh, A and B, and this both of them together form the quaternary structure. Now, if one performs electrostatic calculations, and I have mentioned the two names here, we suddenly see this protein surface in a whole different light. You can, the scale goes from plus 10 to minus 15, and you suddenly can appreciate the surface with different crevices and pockets showing different electronegativity. So snapshots here show that you have the negative electrostatic pockets, some of them present here, and then you have positive electrostatic pockets. So from a drug discovery point of view, this is a very critical information one needs to take into account for, and the drug complementarity with these electrostatics shall have a role to play on this. So, um, Generally, the workflow I would like all of you to consider here is actually uh, where you have a crystal structure and a model or a model structure, which is generally a static structure. It would be helpful if you do a molecular dynamics refinement to take into account the environment factor. And after performing your protein and ligand docking, again, which you will learn to extensive details, in the coming weeks, one would check the stability of this protein ligand complex. Uh, now, here I would actually like to put in another uh, tool that we have been developing in our lab. And here, 
This is a tool that was developed to characterize the inner cavity lining of proteins. Now, where is this going to be important? This could be very well be important when you have oligomeric proteins of the virus, and you would like to understand how, which are the, first of all, residues which are lining this inside of this interface. And this method is right now available online, and we try to uh, push this uh, forward uh, just before the drug hackathon so that all of you could use it. It's right now online, though it has not been published yet. And here you can identify core residues, the evolutionary variability, which you can see here in green, blue, and red. Also, it gives atomistic and residue level details, as well as volume and diameter calculations. Now, here I actually managed to um, go through really fast with my slides, but I would like to recap here by saying that we dealt with the introduction of three-dimensional structure and the concepts of how the surface chemistry works. We talked about the basics of homology modeling and why and how it works like. We talked about the importance of molecular dynamics and its strength, as well as environmental factor. And another key aspect was about the accessibility of sites. Now, finally, of course, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Abhijayde, who has been leading this effort constantly and has been more than proactive on this. Dr. Jian Shastri, who has been leading this whole uh, academic affair of teaching uh, all the participants. Dr. Kunal Roy, Dr. Srinivasan, Dr. Nagmani, who has been constantly helping us with the technical details here. Uh, people who have worked and interacted with recently, Priyanka and Anshu, and of course, all the colleagues of the Drug Discovery Hackathon 2020. And finally, I would like to um, thank my lab. And I will be open for any Q&A questions. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your informative talk. Sir, we have lot of appreciate. We have received lot of appreciation for your talk, and we also received lot number of questions. But due to time constraint, we are going to take a few questions. So, sir, may I start? Absolutely. Okay, sir. So, so first question uh, is asked by Kushbu Malbari. She's asking, uh, what is the parameter to look into the results of homology modeling that can be uh, that can given us insight into whether the resulted mod homology model is satisfactory? OK, that's a really good question. And uh, it's a question which generally people overlook. Uh, so thank you, Kushbu. Uh, there's a whole field known as model quality estimate programs, and it's not a trivial thing as you rightly uh, asked that uh, how to know if a model is close to its native structure or not. So generally what you would do is if you are modeling from a server, it will give some scores. Now these scores are are mostly fine-tuned towards the models developed by that method, but I would strongly urge that uh, you to read on a paper which has recently been, every two years it's published on CASP, which is Critical Assessment of Structure Prediction. That's a competition that happens every two years. And every two years, all the structure prediction methods, all the scoring methods are reassessed and try to find out what is the best method currently available to assess your model, rather than just blindly following what the scores you get from your method. So yes, that's, that's what I would suggest. Thank you, sir. Second question is, uh, what are the other modeling methods? Which one is more preferable and why? 
Okay, so uh, if you remember the uh, slide where I talked about sequence identity versus how the quality of model works, uh, here there is no uh, direct answer of which method works best. The reason is it depends completely how good of a sequence identity match you have with the template. Now, if you have some basic understanding of homology modeling, you would understand that around 40% is where you would be pushing the limits and doing it from homology modeling. Slowly beyond 30%, you're in the realm of ab initio modeling where you actually do not uh, use this template model. All of these methods have its own different uh, do's and don'ts, and I would strongly urge that in the coming weeks when we were going to be teaching homology modeling, perhaps attending that would give a clearer answer. But in short, it would be based upon the sequence identity match. Thank you, sir. Third question is, uh, can induced feed docking give an idea about change changes in the active site of enzyme after a non-competitive molecule binds to its elastic site? Yes, it can. But again, and uh, this also goes to show that we are serious about this endeavor of drug discovery hackathon. So one of the best models and methods to do these induced fit models are from Schrodinger. And as you perhaps may have even heard it, that uh, now Schrodinger is going to be available for you, which is a, per a very expensive software, but it's going to be available to all the participants free of charge when they perform it through CDAC. So induced fit model is all about uh, capturing the realistic uh, uh, conformation changes which you talked about. Of course, the length in which uh, the number of runs that you do is going to determine how long you're letting the environment uh, breathe, if I may say so. So as long as possible one does that, the more chances are your receptor will relax around the ligand. Thank you, sir. Next question is, uh, how can we validate docking accuracy on homology model protein via cross docking? OK, this uh, I think this is a little technical because cross docking again is a, a different technique. I, I would strongly urge that uh, this should come up after we have taught uh, docking in our course, because then it would be much more useful for all the participants. But it, it is it is it is uh, it is a valid question, and I think uh, that is one way to validate it. Thank you, sir. Next question is asked by Satya. What is the ideal grid search space in molecular docking? OK, ideal grid search space. <laughs> we are getting a lot of uh, technical questions here, but ideal grid search space is. Uh, if you have no idea where this active site is on the protein, then perhaps uh, ideal grid search would be doing it blind and having the whole receptor uh, enclosed within the docking box. But if you have a uh, understanding or a possible understanding of where the active sites and like I showed by me pockets, if you have an idea on that, then you could have the grid space or based on that. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is from Geetu. What is molecular docking refinement? OK, I think what she meant was molecular dynamics refinement. But uh, okay. or maybe maybe I have misspelled it on my slide even. So molecular dynamics refinement means is exactly what I showed uh, as uh, the role of environment. If in that case where we had the protein without the membrane, if I did not result uh, in stabilizing it in the membrane and lipid environment, 
it would have been an incorrect representation of all the crevices and pockets that would have been formed. So a refinement which leads towards a stabilized MD simulation structure is known as MD refinement. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, uh, we will wind up here. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for being with us. I hope uh, the participant got a very good overall idea about the receptor, which will be, I think, definitely helpful for them to uh, participate uh, drug discovery hackathon. Uh, I request all the viewers to join again at 4 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very thank much. You.